current form of money that we have today is obsolete. We've been using the same system for, for centuries. What we need is a new form of money that is fit for the future. Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And that was Gilbert Verdian, the CEO of Quant and Digital Pound Foundation. They announced that Quant did it today, launched Overledger platform. This is the same tech that was used in the project Rosalind with the Bank of England and the Bank of International Settlements. You can issue digital money and assets, move it from one blockchain to another, these apps run on any network with smart contracts and on any blockchain. I am so bullish on Quant. At the time of this recording, you can see that the market is mixed. We're going to talk about XLM. Look, they're up over 6%, almost 7% on the 24 hour. Also, Aaron Kaplan, the CEO of Prometheum. Oh, he was set on fire today. And Ripple has bought back shares, Ripple shares, not XRP. We're going to talk about that. And Flare Networks, well, they have found their niche. And let me tell you, it's massive. Let's look at XLM here really quick. I did respond to Sammy, who uh, on Twitter, we often go back and forth about XLM. Uh, I have not uh, had a significant amount of XLM for a while. But it doesn't mean I wouldn't get back in. Again, as I've told everyone, I am always just one uh, to easily go in and out of any asset, uh, taking advantage of timing and market trends. So anyway, this is uh, what I'm thinking right now as to why we have the Grayscale XLM Trust increasing so much. In fact, at the time that Sammy posted this, it was up 97% on the 24 hour. It's actually up even more than that. So here are my four ideas as to why, and it is um, my speculative take. The first is BlackRock. They renewed institutional investor interest with their filing of a spot Bitcoin ETF. Yeah, I, I'm just sure that the whole world took pause and said, well, wait a minute, maybe I need to really pay attention to this asset class. Secondly, Grayscale announced that their estimated revenues for two of its trusts hit the highest level since May of 2022. That's pretty good. And of course, number three, the stellar Coinbase announcement with the USDC coin. That was a big announcement. And last, any good investor is going to look for undervalued entries. And I think XLM was an undervalued entry. It's doing a fabulous job at securing the Stellar network. You do have to open up a Stellar wallet, which requires one XLM. Every transaction does burn a fraction of the XLM digital asset. And with USDC, it's not only an on and off ramp for fiat, but an on and off ramp for crypto. And if you've got a Stellar wallet, well, it's very easy to put XLM in that wallet. You're gonna to listen to a short clip where you'll see that Gensler does not have the force of law. This was an excellent video today with Laura Shin's podcast. A securities attorney was just all over the Prometheum CEO with the facts. And as John Deaton weighed in, yeah, tokens being securities, no way. This guy was 100% wrong. Prometheum needs to listen in on the space that John's going to have at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today. Keep your eye on the Twitter feed of Crypto Law TV or go to their YouTube channel and click on the Live tab, and I'm sure you'll be able to catch everything as it happens. The reason the SEC has basically said that almost every token besides for Bitcoin is a security is because it's an application of the law. I think what you're referring to there are, you know, Gensler's statements about this. And as I'm sure you know, and, and Laura's uh, audience will know, Gensler's statements do not even speak formally for the SEC, and they definitely don't have the force of law, right? But then you want to use, use those statements. Like, please, you want to use the Hinman right? statements. You want to say the Hinman statements have the force of law, but the chairperson of the SEC doesn't?
it doesn't have a larger implication than what a you know a head of corporate finance says. You're basically contradicting yourself, man. I didn't bring up the Hinman uh, statements at all, actually. Uh, and the one that's contradicted himself is Gensler. You know, you know, we've all listened to the videos where he argues that a lot of the tokens are not securities, and, and now he's turning around and saying that they are, right? And, and just to be clear, the law hasn't changed. It's just Gensler's political calculus that has changed. And I think if you, if you drill down on the law, there's two important nuances that you need to understand. You can sell any asset in an investment contract transaction, and then that transaction or scheme is itself a security, right? That's, that's going back to Howey, uh, the seminal case interpreting investment contracts, uh, where a court found that uh, a promoter that was selling interest in an orange grove, along with a services contract, was issuing a security. But no one in their right mind would think that the orange plots were themselves securities, right? So I think the first step that you're missing, Aaron, is distinguishing between an investment contract and the ultimate object. In this the case, instrument is the token. security. In this case, the tokens, right? And, <laughs> and I think the tokens the are the security. Here. The second point that you're missing, Aaron, is that there's zero precedent applying Howey to secondary market transactions, right? Uh, in, in the case of digital assets. If you go outside of digital assets, the only case to ever apply Howey to secondary markets is uh, Hawking versus Dubois, which is a case dealing with real estate. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that one. But it's, it's curious that the SEC in that case actually wrote an amicus brief arguing the diametrically opposed point that Aaron is making and, and, and that the SEC is now making, saying that basically... In secondary market transactions, where there's not an issue, the issuer is not a party to the transaction. There's no contract, so then there can be no investment contract, right? So, Rodrigo, we're not going to agree on the law because we just obviously because have different interpretations. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. But then, what is the best way to protect the American public? How is the best way to protect investors? I think the the best way to uh, protect American investors and also keep uh, crypto in the U.S. is to carefully consider the thoughtful legislation that has been introduced in the House and in the Senate, and that, frankly, you're looking to distract from by claiming that we've solved this issue by saying that Prometheum is the, the, you know, the path to compliance, when what you have, Aaron, is a license, but you don't have a business. Earlier this year, the Genfinity Series 65, a free first-step guide towards accreditation to pass the FINRA test, was uploaded. And the facilitator, Eduardo Zargueta, he's with the IPO Club. He talks about recent ripple buyback of shares in a video discussion that we had today. He's created a 15-question private market quiz to test your financial knowledge. I want Americans to keep an eye on the changes to accreditation status in Congress with Representative French Hill's H.R. 835 that just passed the House. It now goes to the Senate, and it expands to those who can demonstrate their knowledge a chance to build wealth in private markets. Anyways, this part of our conversation was interesting. Have a listen. Can I ask another question? So, so it's really, um, I would think, a good thing if you purchase private equity and maybe within before that liquidity event happens, if you have the company that goes and buys back some of those shares in circulation, that would be a good thing for the holders, right? Because it's reducing the amount of circulating shares, which would mean more parts of the pie for those people who have those shares. Is that is that would that be correct to say? It is, uh, it is correct, and uh, um, what is the most important is at which price the valuation they buy the, the shares. If they buy at a higher valuation, like in the case of what's happening now, for instance, with Ripple, uh, I think um, it's um, what happened, Ripple issued some shares, then bought them back at a higher valuation. That meant that the mark where people can mark the shares, all the shareholders can mark their position is higher than where they bought them. So when that happens, there's a happy days for investors. And also then there is a more there is another technical nuances to what you just said, Eric, is that when the company buys the shares, it is true that um, that is the company owing them, but until the company cancels the shares, those shares are still uh, in existence, and therefore the, the the percentage of ownership of the other investors does not change, even if the owner of the other shares 
it gets regrouped into the, the, the issuing company. What the issuing company could do could be to cancel those shares. So just say, okay, we go from a million shares to 800,000 shares. And in that case, at that moment, if the company did that, then the, the, sh the, the, the share ownership of the other investors will increase. But as until those shares are um, in, in the in the capital of the of the company, not much happens other than that the company owns the shares and takes them away from the market, creating more scarcity for other investors to invest into the company. So that's the benefit of what you said. I that see. when other investors want to come and buy, there would be less shares available. So then also too, that tender offer price that was set by Ripple, is that strongly in consideration then when they determine a uh, pre-IPO price when they do go public? Does that does that factor in, weigh into the to the opening share price, do you think? Very much, very much. The reason being that uh, no one wants to lose money. So that means that if uh, someone invests today in Ripple and or if the price of Ripple today is marked at uh, 15 billion, uh, no one wants to go to the market and say, sorry, there's a bit of a, no one wants to go to the market and say, hey, we're not worth 15 billion anymore. We're, we're, we're worth 12, 13. So normally the, the last price of the last round, um, it's it's like the starting point for uh, the new price when the company IPOs. Flare Networks is focusing on a niche that is getting traction and that's data. Hugo, in this clip uh, that's going to take you out, really looks forward to NFTs that are beyond collectibles. For example, the representation of work that appears online. You've got the ownership of that intellectual property. Now, you can just think as wide as you can go because that's really what the ownership can represent. And then if you put the rewards back on to the creators with a distributed platform to create a healthy secondary market of sales where the market sets the price instead of a centralized entity. Wow. I'm talking about really flipping business models on its head. Upper Cent, who is powered by Flare, launched their join yesterday, which is a very interesting business model. And I really wish the best to Jake and his team. They are doing it with education. Once you finish your course, you can then put that course in the form of an NFT back on the market for someone else to enjoy. What a novel idea. So Flare is now really what we colloquially call, um, you know, within the team, the blockchain for data. Uh, and the ability that Flare gives you to use smart contracts with large amounts of data uh, is really what is now getting traction. But Flare can also operate as a layer zero and as a layer two to another network. So kind of Flare has this nice stack of protocols which allow it to kind of have, be multifunctional. Um, I you know, I, 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 I'm really looking forward to see the use case of NFTs expand outside of kind of, uh, I guess, digital ephemeral collect, you know, collectibles and looking to see NFTs representing something else. And, and what Upper Cent does, which I find really interesting, is the, the representation of essentially your work in, um, in you know, in an in a online sort of environment and your ownership of uh, essentially that course and the ability to essentially represent that course as intellectual property, which you own, you paid for, and then you can sell on to someone else. And then each one of those courses, whoever creates them, they're essentially creating an asset of value and they're establishing a market for that through the NFT construct. And, and that, that was pretty interesting to me. Hopefully there's a big enough opportunity to try and provide more value to students by allowing them to purchase a course, resell it, purchase another one using those funds and create this really healthy ecosystem that um, I think we're yet to see. So 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that also has value for the tutor, right? The creator of the content, right? Because, yeah. you know, it means that, uh, you know, you can create, a, I guess, a, a distributed set of content creators and, and their work can establish a market value rather mm -hmm. than, um, you know, but essentially on the resale of the NFTs, right? Um, rather than, uh, you know, uh, some centralized party just saying, this is worth $19 or whatever it's worth, you know, uh, whatever they sell it for. Uh, and I think it means that uh, ultimately it's a great way of kind of optimizing, you know, who's a good teacher, who's a good tutor, you know, their courses have more persistent value, who's a less good tutor, their courses have less value um, and that kind of thing. And that's what really attracted me to the use of like this novel use of NFTs. Uh, and I think there's probably many models that, that can be built around that um, for, you know, lots of different areas. So, yeah, that's, you pitch it much better than I do though. <laughs> what I'm really looking forward to is seeing DeFi get better, get fairer, get faster, get cheaper. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing bridges become uh, less rickety um, so that, people can move their funds around different ecosystems, which lets them take advantage of different opportunities and different yield opportunities. And then I'm really looking forward to seeing the evolution of, I suppose, identity, NFTs, um, really specifically NFTs. Like, I, like I, you know, obviously things like Bored Apes and, and, and such NFTs have been incredibly successful. And, you know, there are definitely... Um, art-based NFTs that have merit um, but I'm really looking forward to seeing the adoption of NFT tech technology to do other things such as what you're doing uh, whereby it enables you know uh, essentially a, a distributed platform um, to exist where it couldn't really exist very easily before um, with you know ownership characteristics 